Uh, with this, let me move to our final speaker of this session, uh, Professor Anup Singh uh, from IT Kanpur, who will talk about regulations and policies, uh, specifically the, in specific case to the power sector. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really sorry for a uh, little bit of mix-up with my PTX. I was trying to say loud side, it's feeling a bit chilly. But uh, nevertheless, I think the stage has been set very well by Navroz, who talked about the broader macro issues, the development perspective, where the electricity sector lies in India, the aspirations of the people, not just in India, but perhaps in the African uh, continent also. And Nitin has uh, brought the another perspective, which is right closer to the consumers, both from the demand size, as well as from the distributed <coughs> energy uh, management system, or distributed energy resources, as we call it. Uh, the power sector lies somewhere in between. It uh, accounts for approximately 49-50% of the total emissions uh, from India, which is substantial. So that's why... So a significant part of the discussion in the, in the Indian energy sector as well as in the climate space, uh, the power sector always takes the center stage. In fact, most of the uh, decision making, uh, broadly speaking, even to the extent of renewable energy, are actually driven at Ministry of Power and then, of course, uh, Ministry of Renewable Energy comes as in, I don't want to use the word appendage, but it, it comes on a broader aspect. But at a macro scale, our sector uh, essentially is looking at this because it's a decision about investments. But at the policy level for promotion of different kind of technologies, the MNRE actually plays a very important role. So looking at the absolute emissions, it's not just that the emissions are large, but they also change from year to year. One of the reasons is, of course, there is something which is driving it northwards, it's the increasing population, increasing atomic aspirations, uh, the industrial energy mix, which tends to be more energy intensive for us, and also the fact that now we have a much larger role of renewable energy, which is emerging on the horizon, uh, starting with, you know, uh, just, a, you know, maybe I think if I recall, probably 10 kilowatt wind turbine at one point of time, now we are talking about 7 to 10 megawatt of machines which are there. Solar power, which was part of a solar, is just a space program, is now virtually everywhere uh, across the landscape. So a lot has changed there. Uh, so that's driven by essentially the change of the emission intensity also in the power sector. And uh, because it depends on how much power you are generating and how much of it is coming from the renewable energy sources. Um, 2000, you know, the COVID year was a bit different. Post-COVID, of course, there was a little bit of vibration. But nevertheless, we are moving in that direction. And given that the... Um, the national targets that we have submitted to UNFCCC, we want to reduce emission intensity by 45% by 2030 from the level of what was there in 2005. And we want to have 50% of renewable energy in terms of capacity by 2030. Right. At least we'll look at one of the, these targets that how uh, it is being already been put on the paper and whether the numbers match or in some way they, are, they differ. Uh, what is the kind of transition that we are seeing? Broadly speaking, we are about 400 gigawatt system as of now, as far as the power generation is concerned. Uh, this is grid connected, and there is some captive also, 40, 50 gigawatt. 50% um, is, as of now, you will say, is currently 200, 4, 205 is accounted by the coal. Uh, some by the gas, 25 gigawatt or so. Renewable is about 104, 105 gigawatt. Uh, but also remember that renewable capacity, when we say it's different, but renewable contribution to the energy basket, what we consume, is also different. Uh, in, in those terms, actually, uh, things have been changing. And one of the interesting aspects, we tried to pull some data from uh, Electric Power Survey, which gives you the electricity demand uh, as you move forward till 2036, 37. And what happens if, actually, if you look at the gray line, if you don't, if you stop adding, actually, any coal power plant, where we will be by 2036-37. And of course, if you uh, put this in the perspective of India energy security scenario, uh, there are different scenarios which are there, heroic effort or something which really think about the thermal capacity coming down significantly. Uh, but even though there is a growing role of renewables, installed capacity, as I mentioned, is growing. But what I wanted to show were more interesting that it's not really uniform, neither across time in terms of parts of the year or in terms of the geography of the country. It significantly differs. For the state like Karnataka, renewable energy share could be anywhere 40-45%. Uh, for Delhi, it will be not even 2% probably, less than 2% or 1%. 1%, yes. And, uh, but it, it varies significantly. Solar, we have availability all across the year, but wind, generally it is strong for four months. 
largely around monsoon months, right? And that too is dominated by the generation which happens largely towards the evening. It starts really picking up. And so the sun comes during the day, the wind starts picking up in the evening. Now, one of the critical question that comes to our mind is that if we are expecting that all that, uh, you know, thermal capacity to be there, we are not going to achieve any kind of net zero or whatever. It's not possible. So suppose we start talking about do we remove all the plants, right? Uh, we say we decommission all the thermal power plants, uh, maybe retain some uh, because it needs some system stability, which is required, which is argued very strongly in the power sector that we cannot do away with thermal power plant in India. It's very difficult. Why? Because if you do that, we have to depend on very expensive storage, not only just in terms of cost to the consumers, but also in terms of the environmental cost of recycling those batteries. So that's why there's a room for a variety of technologies, not just about uh, the uh, battery, but we also have to think of pump storage as well as the demand response program. I just want to link this demand response program to an event which happened over the last one year. The power market prices hit almost 20 rupees. And uh, of course, there was coal supply issues. We did some analysis and we found that had there been a demand response of just about 1,000 megawatt or 1,500 megawatt, out of the total peak demand of about 200 gigawatt, right, we would have been able to uh, reduce that by maybe 70, 80% very easily, at least 60%. Uh, so that demand response is required not just because we want higher efficiency, but it's also, and of course, conservation of energy assets, but also sometimes it has severe implications for the market and the emergence of various technologies. Uh, now I'm going to dip a little bit into uh, Apurva's slide. She's a PhD scholar working with us, and she's working on net zero. So I'm just speaking up some of those just for those uh, students who are academically minded, want to understand what is essentially net zero. You can define with or without international transfers. The idea is if what you are generating in pure mathematical sense, it gets uh, netted out by anything else, whether at the country level, whether at the boundary of a uh, state, whether for a sector, or, or that depends on us to define. And that's how there has been a little bit of discussion on whether we want to have a net zero target uh, for the country as a whole, as uh, it was announced at some point, or we want to have it uh, maybe initially at a sector level to be supported with various kinds of market interventions, uh, especially in the space of renewable and carbon. Okay, so this is again something how it is different from emission targets. For targets, we generally say reduce it there, and for, uh, for uh, net zero, you have a very strict boundary. You can't really, you don't want to go beyond that. The global landscape is very interesting. It's not just uh, the countries are talking about it, essentially, uh, it's the at a sub-national level also, at the city municipal limit level also, now there is talk about net zero. Um, the corporations are talking about net zero. Uh, there was earlier talk about net water, right? I recall one of the, in these beverages the companies in India also decided that uh, they will have, I think, uh, net zero in terms of water requirement by, I think, some 2030 or something. Uh, so they are actually, corporates are coming forward in a big way. Uh, many companies based out of Bangalore they actually are uh, need, they say, we need renewable power for our data servers also. Right? So that transition is already happening. And these are international corporations who are driving how we consume electricity in India. And now we are looking at, of course, the marketing of green electricity as well for the consumers like you and us. Uh, in terms of who are the targets, well, some have actually uh, have uh, taken it in the form of law. For us, it has been just a declaration. In terms of law, no, we didn't do it. What we decided, so 2070 is a net zero target that you hear, is only it was an announcement which was made in a speech, it's not on the paper anywhere, it's not a target for the country as of now. But that doesn't mean that we should stop uh, thinking about it. We should actually start thinking about it precisely because it's not yet there on the board, on the table. Is it possible for us to think of something that uh, initiative, maybe it's a sectoral level, maybe national level, and that's the idea I have been toying that is it possible for us to start thinking about net zero commitments at a smaller level, at a sectoral level, where it can be measured and verified. Remember, at the national level, if you want to do it, one of the you know, MRVs are very important. You want to really measure it and also verify it. Uh, it has to be recorded, it has to be verified. Uh, there are a variety of uh, reasons why people differ in terms of time, when they want to go, 2045, 2050, 2060, that's why we chose probably 2070. Uh, but perhaps uh, a few years down the line, we might uh, start thinking about that, but some research groundwork has to be done perhaps now. Coming to the crux of it, which we are talking in terms of regulatory and policy initiatives, 
India is really proud to have one of the dedicated ministries. Perhaps we are the only one in the world to have a ministry of new and renewable energy. We started way back, I think, almost uh, 40 years ago. And um, this, this has been driven, of course, I may differ in terms of how this was implemented, not successful, not any efficient. But more recently, when you started thinking it from a systems perspective, from, from the perspective of adding the capacity, there there was a lot of, uh, in fact, traction. What we could not achieve in wind, we could achieve through the competitive bidding for the solar energy. And that has been there. So it's I'm not sure if it is going to be visible, but let me try and zoom it a little bit. So what we came up with National Action Plan for Climate Change, which included actually the National Solar Mission, and now Solar Mission has its uh, different versions. We did talk about offshore policy at one point of time, but as of now, we haven't seen anything, but we're likely to see something in terms of offshore wind. Again, the cost uh, tends to be higher, especially for the subsea transmission as well as for the transformation of energy. Uh, remember, one of the very critical points which I'll mention towards the end is also just having renewable is not going to work. So very recently there was a meeting uh, uh, in Delhi, top level meeting where uh, it was discussed with regulators, also it was discussed with the power companies. They say, okay, why is it that we are not seeing you know, growth in renewable energy at the state specific level? Uh, specifically, the roof solar rooftop program is just not picking up. So we were asked to give a comment on UP solar policy. So um, uh, there was the UP power conclave in Lucknow uh, about a month ago. So we did send our comments. And one of the very important thing was, look, we were exactly doing the same thing which was there in the previous solar policy. We are just more or less tweaking it here and there and trying to say this would also work. It is precisely because it didn't work here, we have to have a different document now. Because our target the previous time was 4,300 megawatt of solar rooftop. And what did we achieve? I think 250 megawatt or something. And that too driven by the institutions, not by the individual consumers. That makes a much bigger difference. And this is something everywhere. Of course, uh, there are initiatives which are good. We talk about green hydrogen. I've been part of discussions at MNRE uh, for uh, the last three, four months, starting with the European policy, which was there about green hydrogen, then about green hydrogen standards. We are, of course, not just thinking about consuming ourselves. In fact, we are in starting to think in terms of export. Why? Because it's expensive. If it's expensive, let's export it. Ratnagiri half us, right? <laughs> it have another way around. So if it's expensive, better sell it to them. And when it becomes cheap, we'll start consuming ourselves. So I think that's the kind of strategy we are moving forward. But all of this is driven by somewhere policy and regulation. It sounds very you know, innocuous kind of, harmless kind of word. But this is what decides the return on investment for anybody. This is decides whether somebody will press a button or not. So this is a very important aspect that one should pay attention. Coming to this important data, we said we want to have 50% of renewable capacity. We actually have a RPO trajectory now very recently received by, uh, released by Ministry of Power. We are trying to achieve about 43%. And this 43% is at the national level, right? Uh, this is at the national level. So I think uh, it was, uh, somebody mentioned, you mentioned that, look, we have a common uh, uh, RPO across the country and uh, is it really possible for us? Well, we have differentiated resource base, differentiated economics, differentiated uh, consumer base. This power system itself looks different. Is it strong enough to absorb that much money? But now we have a national level uh, target, which is still not 50%, which means actually, and this even being is being resisted, if I can tell you that very clearly. It is, even this is something people say would be very difficult. It will be challenging. Of course, we are going, we are, it's not that we are not doing anything. The sector is not doing anything. A lot much is happening. In fact, this is a sector which is so dynamic. If I teach something just three months ago, by the time I come here, it's all over. It's all finished. So you see the slides. It's, they keep on, it's, it, there is so much of activity happens and we give our comments very often to almost all the regulatory and policy documents which come out of Ministry of Power, MNRE, Niti Aayog, a uh, little bit maybe Ministry of Coal, and of course all the regulatory commissions across India, including center and the states. And one of the things we have noted very clearly, because we interact a lot with regulatory commissions, that targets are good, we need to go there, but sometimes the necessary groundwork tends to be missing, and the uptake is also missing. I think Navroj mentioned that, look, it's any utility sees a business of inviting a rooftop solar is going, is going to hurt me. And we are being told that we invite more of them, right? 
Uh, so any, every single electron which is pumped by a solar rooftop through net metering or even gross metering, whichever way, it is actually reducing the incentive uh, for the discoms itself to take up. And why? Because of we have so much of financial burden like there. Uh, and of course, just to show you that look, uh, when I was saying that why it needs to be a bit differentiated, uh, reason is because given the resources we have, perhaps we need to think uh, in a different way. And one of the ways, if you want to have a common target also, is to you know bank on the markets to some extent. So this particular chart shows you the RPO targets which are there and how much has been achieved. Some states do very well and they are able to achieve. And part of it is also there is a you know how we decided the RPO. So if it's a classroom, I would have said that why, what's the economic fallacy there? That why it doesn't work in our case. Uh, there are a variety of ways. Uh, first thing I have already talked about. Second thing is very important. We have now market for renewable energy certificates. It's, well, it has its own ups and downs, but it still has a very, very significant potential. This is a market which we have worked a lot on, uh, right from the ideation till every change that happens. So we have been instrumental in driving the change for this particular single market instrument, which is there. e certs and now, of course, there's a talk of the carbon market as well. Uh, we might actually stand, uh, uh, we'll look at a common market in future, ultimately everybody is displacing a ton of carbon or a kg of carbon. Right? Our integration will remain a challenge, for that's the purpose. We have now power system flexibility which is being driven for the uh, thermal power plants, whether we can back down all the way up to 25%, like some of the German plants which are able to do it. We are still at 55, in some states probably even higher at 70, 75. Storage, we need to think of all options available, not just about battery. We have to, of course, battery will play a role. Perhaps economics will drive down the cost, but at some point we have to think about all kinds of possibility. We haven't started saying anything about coal. To some extent, I will say rightly so, because yes, of course, it has a lot of implications everywhere, specifically for environment. Positive implications, of course, it creates a lot of negative externality where you mine it. Most of our coal is beneath the forest, so you have to actually get rid of the forest to get the coal. Um, EVs and green hydrogen, of course, they are going to play a role, but in electricity, we shouldn't expect that we'll convert electricity renewable to hydrogen and then convert that to use electricity. That's inefficient. If it's for transportation, perhaps for mass transportation, heavy transportation, that will work. Last, of course, demand side management, it has already been mentioned. Uh, these are references. Uh, you can't see anything, but the links are there in the PPT. Uh, some of the relevant papers uh, about uh, climate policy, renewable energy might be of interest to you. Links might be available somewhere. You can check it. Thank you very much. You. And please visit. <laughs> Just last word. We have two institutional initiatives uh, at the Department of Industry and Management Engineering, which is called Center for Energy Regulation, because we work in the energy regulation and policy area. And then is Energy Analytics Lab, which work with literally tons of data. And look at uh, the EAL's website, it's a unique, uh, it doesn't exist anywhere in India. It's a one stop to see anything about the power sector, especially at the system at the market perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you.